Medical Missionary Hour. We have a very special presentation today, so I'm sure that you will be blessed. I am here from um, Maryland, uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, and I'm just delighted. It's the Sabbath day. I'm sure you are as well, and that we're able to come together in this fashion. Uh, last had the Bible study, we sang uh, this song. It's called The Great Physician Now Is Near. The words are, you can sing it in your heart, the great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to chair. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us through this week and for allowing us to see another Sabbath day. We thank you for the blessings that we receive on your Sabbath, God. And I pray that we will just rest in your love, rest in your mercy, rest in your grace on today. I pray that your presence will be with us. We're in various parts of the world on this platform. And I pray, Lord, that we will learn much from what Elder Rolanda will share with us today, and that we will use this information to be a blessing to others. Tabernacle with us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As I mentioned, we have a very special guest, and his name is Elder Rolando Porras. And I'll tell you a little bit about him. Brother Porras is the president and founder of Choose Life Abundant, a full-time not-for-profit health education organization. Elder Rolando received his training at Lifeline Wellness Center on preventative health measures as practiced in the Loma Linda Blue Zone. Elder Rolando is also a graduate with special distinction from the Da Vinci College of Holistic Medicine. In addition, he has a 22 year international career in financial capital markets and has worked at various financial institutions such as Merrill Lynch, Citibank, BBH, and he was also a vice president for an international family office. He has his undergraduate business degree from Bentley University and his master's in business uh, from Dublin Business School. Elder Rolando enjoys surfing, farming, and sharing words of hope from the scriptures. Today, he'll be uh, sharing with us on the topic country living and self-supporting work as a medical missionary. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Brother Porras. Thank you. Um, are you there, Elder Porras? Did we lose you? Okay, so let's just give him some time to log back in. He is frozen. And is, <clears throat> um, is it, am I there still? Yes, you're with oh, us. There. Yes, there you go. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I was just saying that, I don't know if you guys heard me, but I was suggesting that we could start with prayer here. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for the connection. Can you please remove the adversary from this place or from the, uh, the technology that we're attempting to use to glorify your name? I ask, Lord, for your guidance in this uh, talk. It's you who I'd like you to shine and I like to hide. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm thinking, because I'm struggling with a little bit of connection issues, I'm thinking that, well, I think the um, sharing screen thing is off. So I'm glad with, I'm glad that that happened. Um, anyway, I'm grateful for Natasha.
comes to Elder Rolando, you're going in and out. So I'm wondering if the, the reception isn't good. So I'm wondering if it might be helpful to log out. Okay, there you are now. Do you want to try again to okay. see, like to test again? Sure. Another suggestion is to turn off your camera. That might help with the um, bandwidth connectivity. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Or should I just log out? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, very good. I'm gonna take this um the video out so that it helps. I don't know where I left off, but I was saying that as Natasha approached um me there recently with the idea of coming out here and talking a little bit um about what's going on with our ministry and some thoughts about what we're doing. I felt impressed to share that, um, yes, it's a very important subject matter, especially where we are in Earth's history. So there's an urgency um, for us to get into the work so that we can go home. I, um, <clears throat> I know that in Matthew 12, 14, we can go to Matthew 12, 14, the Bible shares, and it says, Although Rolando, we're not what? hearing you. We, we heard Matthew 12, 14, um, okay. and you were about to uh, share it. So I'm wondering if it would be helpful to log out and then come back in. Okay, let me change, um, let, let me do that. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now let's try this again. <laughs> um, I was very happy when Natasha reached out to me there recently and asked me to share a little bit about what we're doing. And um, I felt impressed in sharing the urgency of the work that needs to be done so that we can go home. And I was referring to Matthew 12, 14. And if we can go there with our Bibles, um, the scriptures read, and it says there, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. So there needs to be done. Something needs to be done before we can go home. And we are aware of what the gospel is. So <clears throat> I always like to ask people, what is the gospel? <clears throat> what does the gospel mean to you? How would you define what the gospel is? And oftentimes I'm surprised that we, we stumble a little bit. We fumble with the idea, wait, how do I put it all together? I mean, this is foundational uh, for us as Christians, as Christ followers. And so it would be helpful for us to always be ready with a good answer. I'm not, sharing, I'm not saying everyone has this problem, but I've seen it quite, a, I've seen it. <laughs> and so, so what is the gospel? And well, pretty much, I, I think about it, and I'm thinking that it's all that Christ did so that we could receive his merits. And if we receive these, and if we really believe them, that we receive them, then God counts that as a righteousness. And now what does righteousness mean? Well, righteousness means right works. And so when we have the righteousness of Christ, because people see Christ in us, not us, then they shall see the product of that is the actions, meaning the things that he would do. And so that in itself is that witness that we just read in Matthew 12, 14. Again, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. And so in other words, what I'm trying to share here is that the gospel, yes, it's important to proclaim it. But the gospel has to go beyond proclamation. 
the gospel as as we are understanding based on this on this uh, what i'm just presenting here is really christ in us and so if he is in us literally we can get this work done i mean that's the witness that the world needs to see sometimes though i see that the, the, the end of the world is not coming yet because we're not united we have differences of opinions about things that are trivial but if we really come close together with christ and his doctrines and we really humble ourselves and put pride of man on the dust i'm sure that we can be a united front for the adversary and his attacks what are his attacks well he's he's debilitating the human family by allowing us or distracting us and us partaking of habits that are self-destructive and so they need to hear this message now the question is are we willing to proclaim or are we willing to be a living epistle because proclamation is easy you see i started with the message in 2007 and i changed my diet a little prior to that and i lived as a vegetarian with no problem up until the year 2015. In the year 2015, I ended up in a sanatorium, not because I needed it, because my mom needed it. And so I gave her the, um, I gave her, a, I presented to her an idea. I said, mom, instead of going so much to the Cleveland Clinic back and forth, do you ever try, do you ever consider going to one of our sanatoriums? And she, she, she was new in the faith as well. And so, I said, why don't we go? Why don't I take you to one of them? And we spend a nice week out there. I learn, I see what they're doing and you just go through the treatments. So we ended up going to one in Illinois. And as we were going there, as we were, as we were there, I started discovering through their health assessments that I was not well. I realized that I was sick too. And that really shook. I mean, I had a good lifestyle. I ate really well. And so I couldn't understand it. I ended up staying an extra, trying to restore my health. Anyway, long story short, we came out of that in much better health. And so why am I telling you that? Well, first of all, I was in Venice and I wasn't aware of, of half of the stuff that they were sharing in there. <laughs> and I realized that now I had something that works. So my question was always, Lord, how do I share the gospel? I worked in a financial district in Florida, and I always had people that I came across that I always wanted to share the gospel with. I mean, we had meetings with Harvard lawyers, people from J.P. Morgan, people from Goldman Sachs, the top banks in the industry. Lovely people. I just always wondered, how do I share with these folks? And every time I, I made the bold attempt to say, hey, you know, I started talking, throwing hit fish hooks out there to see if they would, you know, bite. And I started talking a little bit about faith. I always wanted to take them to that place where I would invite them to a Bible study. And I would do that often. And I would realize that I would be often be stood out, you know, like people would stand me out. And, and in sorrow, I would cry to the Lord and say, Lord, what did I do? What happened? Why can't I? I share this passion I have for your scriptures, for your word, for who you are. What is wrong, Lord? It says your word has power, and I don't understand this. And that's where I felt that the Lord impressed me with the thought, let me show you a different route. And by the time I was already aware of, of, of that health ministry that I visited in Illinois, and I started thinking, Putting this, the Lord impressed me to put these things together. So I started working one-on-one -on -one with people. And I started sharing all these counsels that I found of how well they have done me. And so I started noticing people feeling better and interested in the health message. And you know, that started growing and growing. I mean, I was in downtown Miami in Brickell. Uh, and that's when I realized I'm not, I'm not sure I'm in the right place here. And slowly the Lord impressed me to move out into the suburbs. So I moved out to the north of Florida. I'm in the north of uh, Miami, to another county. 
and I ended up in a house with an extra bedroom. And I said, Lord, I don't need an extra bedroom. But the Lord says, we need a be an extra bedroom. <laughs> so that's fine. And I started thinking, what if we make that extra bedroom a medical missionary office? And so I started sharing now no longer one-on-one. -on -one, I started sharing more as to my community. So every Sunday, I would fuel the ministry with whatever earnings I was getting from my job, which was very easy to do, and just start with a little bit of material to share and setting up a little website and whatever else. And that out of nowhere started gaining traction. I started thinking maybe I should learn more about this. And so I got into school about it. I mean, I used the old sanatorium that I visited to learn and I got certified in a few other things that would allow me to take vital signs and things like that. And before you know it, we had a lot of traction and now, after a long time of me asking that question, Lord, why, why can't I get your studies across with, our, with, with my human family? Now people were asking me in our visitations, hey, what ch church do you go to? Hey, why do you do this for free? Hey, why do you care so much? And so whenever they would ask me these questions, I would always want to share I would always want to share that my faith was Jesus. That is my religion. And so they would ask me, no, no, but you got to go to a church. Which church do you go to? And so slowly I would be sharing about the Seventh-day Adventist church and our health message. And people would be, people wouldn't care so much. They didn't care about our church in the way that, well, I don't know about that. They'd be like, listen, I like to go to your church. So I say, well, we're open on Sabbaths. And another fault, other folks would say to me, how did you, like, because we would use a lot of scriptures to share what the health message would look like. And a lot of people would start getting really curious. And before you know it, I would actually, I would actually bring out the question, would you like to look into this for words of hope? I mean, there's a lot of motivational things in there. There's a lot of things that are helpful. And so people would sign up for it. And out of nowhere, from having zero Bible studies. Now I had a Bible study every day of the week. Maybe I had six or seven Bible studies going, sometimes five, with different people because people need to be met where they, where they are. Okay, so sometimes- This is your last wait, part wait. of the- I'm sorry, am I, are you guys there? Am I off? <laughs> yes, we're here, go ahead. Okay, very good. I don't know with that connection. I, all I see is a black screen on my cell phone. I had to switch over to my phone, forget the computer. <laughs> and, so, <clears throat> and so here I am doing Bible studies with people that have very different levels of understanding of who Jesus is. And I started learning a lot. So the ministry started growing and growing. And out of nowhere, people started leaving donations. And so that was also fueling the expansion of this. Until one day, the Lord impressed me with the country. Now, it all fits together because if you look in the Bible, what is Enoch? What did Enoch do? I mean, I already had my commute into, into the city was an hour, maybe an hour 30, and back maybe sometimes an hour 45. So that's a long commute on a daily basis. But Enoch would also live outside of the city he would bring the good news, proclaiming or perhaps witnessing those good news. And people would be interested in hearing more. And he would be able to bring them to his house. And he would be able to share exactly what I was doing. Now, you got to keep in mind that we're ambassadors of the Most High. And as ambassadors, we need to look like ambassadors. We need to live like the ambassador. So my home was always tidy. Before people would come in, I knew that a house needed to, needed to be in optimal conditions. And so Enoch was doing that, but Enoch was not in the suburb. Enoch was in the country. So these little things started bugging me. And I knew it. I knew that I had to make the move, but I was so anchored to my job. I mean, it paid me really well. It was a prestigious job. 
I would meet with people that would be high players in the industry of finance and politics. Sometimes we would meet with Jeb Bush. Sometimes we would meet with Bob Dole from the financial industry, not the political side of things. Sometimes we would meet with um, Al Gore. I would go to conferences where he would be speaking and that kind of environment. So my job was everything for me. Until the Lord said that he put a lot of pressure to me and he shared with me that we needed to grow this thing. And I said, Lord, I, I love to do it. I just don't know how. And isn't that the question that we often find? How do I go to the country? How do I self-support myself out there? Because if we have a trade, we're kind of um, limited to that. And in the country, we're far from our trades. and Not all trades, but I don't know. Most of the times, uh, that seems to be the case. Now, COVID did change a lot of things because now we can work remotely. So that opened up some doors for us as well. But I was stuck with my job and I knew it. Years went by and I knew it until one day. I mean, I always asked the Lord, how do I get this done? Until one day the Lord froze my job. I mean, I worked in a family office and I don't know if you know what a family office is, but if we don't know what a family office is, just think of someone like, Elon Musk or Bill Gates, someone that has way too much capital, their net worth are, net worths are exceeding the billion mark. And so when you have that kind of money, you don't just put your money in the banks, you set up your own bank and you call that a family office. Now the family office, you need it to be run by very capable people. So my boss was an ex Goldman Sachs banker and he hired me to run the stock market portion of the app. Of the office and so while we while i was doing that work i uh i felt that i couldn't do that elsewhere because we had to meet with clients now it's all very interesting that one day the client and my boss had a fallout and so they closed the office and here i was left with a few clients thinking i can work from home i guess but that also dwindled a little bit and the conviction came, expand the ministry. So I'm thinking, well, I could always go back to banking, but the conviction was too strong against us. So I'm thinking, okay, let me expand the, the ministry. And I'm thinking already, if I don't get my salary like I used to in the banking industry, maybe we can get the salary from the ministry. So I entered the ministry with the wrong foot. And guess what happened to that ministry? Well, the ministry, Prior to that, if you would call me, Natasha would call me or Kiva would call me and say, hey, I'd like to come out for a visitation, consultation. I would say, I am so sorry, but the next opening is in 10 months. But out of nowhere, the, the, the visitors stopped coming. So my ministry also collapsed. So my job collapsed, my ministry collapsed. I was really against the, uh, a hard and a rock, a rock and a hard place. And so here I, I started losing hope. Then what would you like me to do, Lord? I mean, I don't get my salary anymore and I don't see any foot traffic in our ministry. What would you like me to do? And I started losing hope, which is a very dangerous place. See, Satan wants you to go into a place. It's a miry, it's moving sand it's just it will swallow you up in the place of hopelessness he also puts you there when you uh, you have fear and so fear and hopelessness are very dangerous things and so here i was fearful of the future fearful of that and now i just didn't have too much hope and i fell into anxiety and depression i didn't know that but some, somehow my sister picked up on it and she said, Rolo, Rolando, we need to do something about that. Why don't you come and visit Dr. Nedley? And go through his program. And I did. I don't know what got into me, but I did. <laughs> anyway, when I went through those 10 days, it completely changed my hopelessness to hopefulness. And I came back out of that with renewed strength, with now a, the right motives for ministry. 
And um, I started thinking we can really work something out here. I started really getting on fire for medical missionary work, but I was still in the city and the prospects of my ministry were still low. And I started changing things. Once I changed the, the modus, once I changed and I acknowledged that this is for God's benefit, not for my benefit, the visitors started coming back again. And I started going to camp, uh, camp meetings and trying to get more current and learning more and getting more connected. And before you know it, I went to a camp meeting where I heard all about country living. And when I was out there, I prayed with a friend of mine, James Taylor, I said, do you mind if you pray for country living? And that was in an August, the months of September, I got onto a car because I knew that what we pray for just, it doesn't have to stop there. We just don't ask. We got to ask, seek, and knock, says the gospel. Says the, um, the uh, yeah, the Bible, right? And so my, my prayer needed to add some legs. I needed to add some legs to my prayer and I got on to seeking. So I started looking for properties in Colorado, Tennessee. I mean, lots of states, Kentucky, Atlanta, I'm sorry, Alabama. And um, I, in North Carolina, and I started finding 50 properties later, I found the one. I mean, I already written a sketch and make some drawings of what it should probably look like. And I did that prayerfully. And when I found this property, it was a perfect match. And so I knew that I had to come here. So that was the prayer happened in August. I started looking in September. By October 17th, I'm closing on a property. And I am already packing my bags on my way out here thinking, what am I doing? I don't even know. I don't even know what country living is like. I mean, I've been sitting behind a computer for 22 years. So here I am moving into this very remote place where there's no signal. As you've noticed, I have to speak this way because sometimes the signal, we're in a satellite. And sometimes the signal is just not clear. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the Lord was teaching me patience. And I moved out here. And again, I don't know what I'm doing. But you see, God doesn't call the qualified. God calls those that are willing. And so most people ask me, how do I become a medical missionary? I said, you got to talk to God about it. Meet with him. Let him be your teacher. Ask him. And he will guide you to the material. He will guide you to the schools. He will guide you to the sanatoriums. He will answer you if you're willing to do his will. So here I am learning that hard lesson. Here I am selfish. Here I am, I want things done now. Here I want my way. And the Lord was teaching me a <laughs> different routine, a different schedule, different order of things. And what I've learned in the last three years and so had been priceless. I have learned that perfection in my character is not about perfecting the property, perfecting the grass. It is about me changing my attitude about what I'm experiencing here. The difficulties of living out here have been very educational for me to start changing my mind about hardship. There's been blood, sweat, and tears. I came out here and I said, Lord, I'll give you everything. My savings, everything is now all yours. And I do not know how I will survive unless it is not for your provision. I do not know everyone where I'm going to live. All my contacts, my financial contacts, I'm going to put them aside. And I'm just going to trust in you. So my, my contract with God was, I will not do any advertising. I will not go ask for donations. If God is my bridegroom and the church is the bride and I am the church, I never met any wives going out to other men for provisions. And so I said, Lord, you are my bridegroom and a good bridegroom never forsakes his wife, never forsakes his bride. He always provides food, clothes, shelter, and love. I mean, that's what you say in Exodus 21. Those are the three things. Four things with Deuteronomy 24 are these. The contract for a marriage needs to be food, clothing, marital duties, which is love, and faithfulness. And so I will trust that you are a good bridegroom. Here you will find me serving, cleaning, washing, everything. 
and you will bring your people and I will serve them with your strength. So that's what we did. Now we've received a lot of friends, cardiologists, nurses, psychologists, I mean everything, all sorts of people. We have received people from the financial industry, people from Iceland, people from New York, people that know their stuff. Sometimes it's intimidating, but I say, Lord, you are more smart. I am not smart, but you can use me. Help me, because I know you love these folks. And guess what he does? He helps me. Now, I don't, I don't claim any glory, any, any victories here. It's all his work. And so as we're going through this program, I started finding out that country living, moving out here, needed to happen. That's important. Most important thing you could do for yourself is to develop your character. And that's what this did for me. Now, I keep asking the Lord, give me patience. Give me love for the unlovable. Teach me how to care. You know, guess what God does? He just doesn't put it in my heart to love more. I mean, he, love is received. Don't get me wrong. There is that there, yes. But it's not the full equation. When I say, Lord, help me be patient. Out of nowhere, someone calls me and says, I need to come to your program. I said, okay, what seems to be the problem? Well, I am struggling with anxiety. I'm struggling with depression. Nothing is working out for me in life. I need to come out. So I said, okay, we'll go through the application process and we get him over here. And that, what I started discovering is that whenever I, the Lord sends very difficult situations to me. <laughs> I have a test that we do to determine whether you're an upholder, whether you're an obliger, a questioner, or a rebel. And these are just how we meet our, how we deal with our outward or inner expectations. This is not necessarily that you are a rebellious person or that you are necessarily a questioning person. This is how we deal with things. We question things. Do we oblige to things? And so oftentimes the Lord sends people with rebellious, rebellious uh, outward and inward expectations. And it's interesting because I have to now learn how to cope and work with folks that don't necessarily want to follow. So the Lord keeps bringing me back to the Exodus story. And that's a gift that he has given us. That is our flagship Bible study in this place. What we do if we start sharing, that's the first study that we do with folks here. We start looking at Egypt. First of all, prior to Egypt, we discover that Jacob lived in Canaan, in Israel. But there was a famine. And the question I always ask our friends is, what, is, what are you famished of? What is it in life that you, what is it that thing that you're missing out in life? It could be your health. It could be a spiritual famine. It could be a job. It could be food. I do not know. Only you know, and you don't have to tell me, but God will impress that in your heart. What is your family? And so we either have a choice. We resort to God or we go to Egypt. And oftentimes, as humans, we like to go with what the world has to offer. And we go to it. And so they did. They go to Egypt. And in Egypt, the Pharaoh says, stays with us. Bring your family. And is it easy to leave once you're stuck in a place like that? I mean, Egypt will never satisfy you and you're gonna get stuck in that hole. So that's where we start with our friends. Are you in Egypt? How do we get out of Egypt? If you wanna get out of Egypt, we need to embark on a very special journey all the way to Mount Sinai, but this is an unknown path and you will not know what's ahead except that in this journey, there'll be heart, there'll be hydrotherapy, <laughs> there'll be fasting, there'll be, um, sometimes salads for breakfast. I mean, there'll be a lot of things, just as you find in the story of the Exodus, the laws of health are present in there. All you gotta do is look for them and you will start finding them. And so as we are embarking on this journey, the Lord took him out of the city into the wilderness, into the country to teach 
teach them of who he is, of his love, so that as it was with Nebuchadnezzar, as it was with his own sanatorium process, think of it, he lost his mind, he ends up in the fields, going through all the laws of health, until seven years later, his mind was ready to acknowledge God. Isn't that what the, uh, Daniel chapter four says at the very end? The last very verse of that chapter says that he was, God was able to humble him. And that moment that he did, the moment that we bury our pride, the moment that we put self aside and we realize we're creatures, my friends, that we're not creators, with creatures. And the moment I realized I am a creature, I need to assume the role of a creature. See, you creatures need to be provided for. I have two cats here. I, I bring them their food every morning and they're waiting at the door. And so I am. Am I a creature? Am I a creature of God or am I the one that provides for my? Nothing in this earth belongs to me, it all belongs to Him. The moment Nebuchadnezzar found that truth, he acknowledged God and he was healed. So our job as sanatorium workers is twofold, says Ellen White. Number one, prepare a people to meet thy God. And number two, bring present truth. How do you prepare a person to meet thy God? Well, you need to take them away from distraction. You need to take away those things that impedes the numbs, the frontal lobe. How do I do that? Well, you set the mind in the same process of the Exodus journey. As you're doing that, the mind is clearing little by little. Do you know? Do you know if you eat a very fatty, hearty meal in the mornings? Do you know what that does to your brain? Do you know that saturated fat and all these things they uh, clog your arteries, they shut, close your arteries. Do you know that perfect health depends on perfect circulation? And so the moment I eat a, fart, uh, a hearty, fart, uh, hearty, fatty meal, <laughs> can make you farty as well. The moment you eat a meal like that, um, your brain oxygenation, your, your oxygen in the brain, drops from 100 to 65% as quick as three hours. Three to six hours. That's where you hit the 65% mark. Now, can a muscle, can an organ, can you function with low levels of oxygen? Yes, but not optimally. Uh, maybe if you really lose oxygen, you will not make it, period. That's what happens when those guys climb the Himalayan or the Everest rather, and they lose out of oxygen, they may just faint and collapse. How many climbers are passed out up there and they lost their lives? Now, you lose that kind of oxygen in your brain for the, from in the sixth hour, it will take you three full days to go back to 100%. Now, that is just breakfast. Imagine you add also a hearty, fatty meal for lunch. You will bring that down again, and then for dinner, and another time again. Sometimes people are not functioning with oxygen in their brains. Is it a mystery why they're not able to grasp the simplicity of the gospel? Do you get frustrated when you share the gospel and people are not grasping it? Do you think, man, what is wrong with them? Why are they so stubborn? Perhaps the question needs to be, is their brain filled with oxygen? Is their frontal lobe numb? That is just a fatty, hearty meal. But sometimes we like to add some coffee in there. <laughs> do you know what coffee, one cup of coffee can do to your brain? It will reduce the blood flow to 40%. So, you really have a lot of folks out there that have suboptimal functioning brains. Can you share the truths of God when the brain is not present? Not very easy. And that's why, my friends, that's why 
it is very important to give people time, but to also help them reform, restore, rebuild, refresh their minds. And the moment you do that, the moment you're instrumental in that regard, is the moment they are opening their brains to truths that they couldn't have done otherwise. But it's not just food. It's also other things we need to consider. We need to pair up a good diet with good exercise. Do you know, or did you know, that 75% of a good diet, 65 to 75% of the benefits of a good diet, you throw in the trash bin if you're not working out, so we could think, hey, I'm vegan, I can get away with not so much exercise. But you would be surprised that the people that we see here, the majority of them, don't look that great in the microscope. We have something called the dark field, hematological, micro, micro viviscopic analysis. And that's the work that I do. I look at them just like what I love. Uh, a lab technician would do with a little droplet of blood. You put it on the microscope, you look at it, and you study the morphology. That means the shape of your red blood cells. I went to, uh, I took a course for that. And so I have my diploma here on the wall uh, to help people feel more comfortable with that. And everything that we do is obviously very high standard, but that's very revealing. A lot of folks tell me, I'm healthy, I'm healthy. I look at the morphology of the red blood cells, it doesn't look healthy and they, they see that themselves. And so that brings conviction. I don't tell them you're not healthy. They themselves look at it. And that my friends is convicting. That my friends is where the folks tells me, how do I change? What do I need to do? And now we have the answers. And so it is with the gospel. You see, as in the natural, as in the spiritual, we don't just share with people, hey, you need to be happy, look for Jesus. That is like telling me, telling people, hey, you need to be healthy, eat a vegan diet. It comes in one ear, exits the other ear. But the moment they see their state, it's the moment they say, I gotta change things. It's depressive to see your red blood cells out of shape. Sometimes they're too, too little, microsites. Sometimes they're too big, macrocytes. Sometimes they're elliptical. Well, that has to do with hormonal changes, endocrine system, or it could be very starry shaped, poikilocytes they're called. And so that perhaps could be toxicity, free radical damage, or it could also mean dehydration, as simple as that. When they're too big, well, maybe that's a deficiency of vitamin B12 and folic acid and maybe a few other things. But if they're too small, that could be a deficiency in iron. And so, now I know what to pr provide for them in their dishes as we're going to eat. But it's the same in the gospel. See, we don't share Jesus for happiness. We share Jesus because that's the antidote of your disease. What is my disease? Well, you have something that is called terminal cancer, spiritual terminal cancer. And you can prolong your life here on earth to be useful for God, or you could really end up in a couch. Yesterday, I had a young guy come over. He did a consultation with us. We do, that's our flagship. That's what attracted a lot of folks in Florida, that little study, that, that uh, health assessment that we do that I just shared with you. And he came over, sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it's six hours. I mean, we have a lot of questions to answer. And we did that test. He was only 33 years old. But he kept falling asleep everywhere he could. He went into the couch, he fell asleep. In our consultation, he struggled. So as I see that guy, that soul that the Lord loves and brought here, I saw someone that was He couldn't walk up three stairs. He was so tired. We went downstairs to look at our gym. He had to hold on to the rail, 33 years old. I mean, my mom is almost in her 70s. And I can understand if she's not in shape, she would also hold on to the handles. 
but 33 years old, there's so much that we're wasting. And if we are not fulfilling the greatest potential of our purpose, the purpose that God gave us here, we will fall into this spiraling tunnel of depression and hopelessness. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. What is our job? Isaiah 58. Are you familiar with Isaiah 58? In Isaiah 58, it tells us our job. And it tells us it is for you, Adventists, to do this job. How do I know it says that? Well, if you read that chapter, you'll find at the very end, it talks about Sabbath keeping. <laughs> and so here now I know that the Lord is putting two types of Christians at the very early stages of that chapter. He says, there is two folks. Those that do everything ritualistic. Those that look, they proclaim it. They, yeah, they look like Christians. But I am not exactly interested in that. Let me share with you what kind of Christians I am interested in. And he talks about that in a way, in, in, with the words of fasting. There are those that, those that fast this way, and there are those that fast this other way. Let me tell you. Proclaim it. Tell Israel where their downfalls are. So that's the microscope telling you where you are. And now let me tell you how you find healing. You will find healing if you start doing right works. What are right works? Liberating those that are oppressed. Liberating those that are stuck, sick, imprisoned by the enemy. How do you liberate them? Medical missionary work. Well, Rolando, I don't know anything about medical missionary work. Don't I need to go to school for that? Oh, my friends, do you think I went to school for that? Here it is, very simple. Ellen White. This is quoted by Dave Fitwick. He wrote a book called The So So. And in that book, he gives a little bit of Adventist history and why we failed at medical missionary work. And he says medical missionary work is simply. You see, we find. Okay, here we are. We could define medical missionary as simple as this. Christian benevolent works. And that, my friends, is the actual definition of medical missionary. What does that mean? You will always have an opportunity to minister to someone. Well, I had a neighbor. She was almost 80-something. And I would see her with her hunchback trying to get her groceries from her car out the window. And I said, how do I work your gospel? How do I share with her the news? God impressed me, help her with the bags. So I did. She didn't want help. But I offered again, and she took my help. I put the bags at her doorstep. I never met her before. And I said, I'm Rolando, your neighbor ever need anything don't hesitate it's so nice to meet you she was very happy the next time i came around from work she was waiting at her door and she grabbed me and she says come on in i'd like to share something with you she shared a glass of water with me whatever i sat down in her sofa on her couch and she started sharing with me her life story now she shared with me she lost her husband to suicide, lost her son to suicide, lost her other son to some sort of accident. She was a widow and no one else there in her life. Isaiah 58 says that we need to take care of widows. So here I am thinking, putting these two things together, how do I take care of her? Lord? So I sat there and I listened and I listened and I listened. After a while, I said, I have to go, my friend. And I walked away thinking I didn't say anything about the gospel. I wish I would have, but the Lord shared with me, no, it's okay. See, she was alone. She had no one to talk to. And when you were in, con in confinement that way, 
It's the worst punishment you can give to someone. Now, was she, was she struggling? Yes, she was alone in that place. But the moment she had someone to talk to, it was like venting. It was like bringing all those things out of that bottle that she had tightened in there. And she felt relief. She felt heard. She felt my friends healed, healing, not necessarily healed, but healing. And the Lord started sharing with me that meant. And so, sometimes the idea may come in my mind. So, sure. I hear you still. But I know, I know better because of my experience. Thank you. There's, there seems to be, there seems to be a disconnection in my mind. Well, I thought I needed to take her blood pressure. I thought I needed to, and don't get me wrong, all of that has its place. But oftentimes we shy away from sharing because we don't know where to start. And you know, before you know, it, if you listen with God's ears and you see with his eyes, you will start discovering that this person may have, maybe struggling with the flu. And so now, you know, wait, I know I can do something like a tea, you know, with lemon and honey and I'll bring it and I'll bring it to her. And now you started the path. You started in the journey where God will continuously teach you, add some cayenne or maybe add some ginger or maybe remove this or maybe add that. And before you know it, God is teaching you how to take care of other folks, because guess what? He's the one that made them. See, a car brings a manual with it. And so do you. And the manual is in the Bible. It's all the laws of health. And sometimes when I don't know what to do with the basics that God is giving me, I go downstairs and I say, Lord, what do we do with this case? God just puts a story in my head or a gospel thing or a gospel quote or something. And I come upstairs and I said, this is what I know. And before you know it, as I am developing the subject, the answers start flowing. Even I am surprised. I'm like, I need to take notes of this. So God is that way with us. Now, I, I like to also share that as they come out to, to our ministry, we want to make things affordable, but beautiful. And it doesn't mean that we need to spend a lot of money on things. But the moment that we have a place that is inviting, it does something to your brains. I'm not into coffee anymore as I used to. I used to work in Switzerland selling uh, trading commodities and one of them was coffee, second largest commodity traded in the world after petrol. And I do remember that the story of Starbucks. Starbucks all took over the market. Why? Because of the ambience. As soon as you walk in there, the environment of it is very drawing. It just it's, it feels cozy and comfortable. And so a sanatorium has to have an ambience that it makes you feel at home. And so you may have the right place. You may have the, the right the country, but you also got to remember that your character influences the ambience. So oftentimes, what we need to do is we need to let the Lord guide. You got to take yourself away from the job and let him do the job. When someone is rebellious, when someone is questioning everything, pray in your mind and say, Lord, take over. Lord, help me love them. Lord, put your love in me for them. Lord, give me wisdom. And you will start finding that Christ in you is possible. And the more we share this with others, that this is a miracle, that this is possible, that you can obtain this. And remember, God's promises are conditional. If you're willing, if you lay your pride aside, if you trust and say, I will do what you say, God will honor his side and give you the beauty of the character of Christ in you. Do I have that? Not there yet do i want that you better believe it how am i doing it continuously connecting with him how do i connect with him god 
I am here this morning. Connect with me. Teach me. Forgive me, Lord. Help me love you more. Feel my faith. I don't have the best character, but you do. This is my weakness, but in it you can be strong. Forgive me for offending people. Forgive me for forgetting or for, you know, for many things. God is faithful to help those that come to him with a contrite heart. And I am sure that he can do that for me. He can do that for you. This, my friends, is the gospel in practice. Again, we know the gospel, what it means. Perhaps some of us don't. Perhaps some of us do. Sometimes we got, just, we got it memorized. But let me tell you this. The gospel in practice is Christian benevolent works in practice, in action. And guess what? God has given us a three-point message. The hardest that there was. Hardest than the one that John the Baptist had to proclaim. I mean, he lost his head. For it. And did you know that John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest of them all? And did you know that John the Baptist did not perform miracles? I mean, talk about humility. When they came over and said, are you a prophet? He says, I am much less. I want us to keep in mind the concept of humility. Because that is it. Now. When we share the three angels message, it's the hardest message. It has fire and brimstone in it. It also has worship in it. It has the seal of God. It has the name of God. It has us returning to him. It has obedience in it. It has Babylon all over the place. How that's fallen, how, do we, how we don't wanna be part of that. And who is Babylon? And what's inside of Babylon? Who is managing Babylon? All those questions will come up if you proclaim that three angels message. But Ellen White says that the right hand of the gospel, the three angels message, the opening wedge requires medical missionary work. So my friends, if we wanna do what God has called us to do, we need to be good soldiers, soldiers that are showering every morning, exercising, doing their hydro. We gotta walk the talk. This morning I'm doing my hydro, I'm thinking, if I am proclaiming this, I got to partake of this. <laughs> and if I don't like cold water, uh, then I pray. And then I say, Lord, take over. You help me with this water. My right hand doesn't want to turn the faucet, but I'll give liberty to it. You just over it and you'll do whatever it needs to happen. And I know you will strengthen me. Give me your spirit. And he's faithful. When I forget to pray, my friends, you will hear, you will heal me. You, you will hear me how, <laughs> like a wolf. And so that water is cold. But anyway, I will end it there. I think we just, we, we got into our, where we, where we finished praying and the introduction. I think we just now clocking in the hour. So I, uh, I, I why don't we, um, is this a time for me to pray or should we pray after? Uh, feel free to pray if you'd like. Okay, why don't we pray? Let me see. Very good. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for these meetings. Thank you for protecting the signal. It was hard at first. I know, Lord, the council say that if you want to hold on to this flag, that the enemy will unleash his fury to prevent communication, prevent the work. He will make our lives miserable. Nevertheless, Lord, Nevertheless, you are greater. I pray at this hour that you encourage anyone that is listening, that you provide for each one the will, the strength, the desire to commit to the only work that will be left. There will be no more ministerial work except for medical missionary work at the end of time. And we're so close, Father. We're so close. Encourage my brothers and sisters here to make the step, guide them. Let them not jump the gun, but guide them to the country setting for the sake of the character development. Help them, Lord, be more hospitable. As it says in Peter, there's three things we need to do. Be watchful and prayer, number one. Number two, love. 
And number three, hospitability. And that, Lord, I understand that is medical missionary work. We don't have to have a sanatorium, but help us open up our homes. Help us have tidy homes where the angels can congregate. And for the reason that they can invite friends over so that people can come in and see their lifestyles, see our lifestyles, and that we can have a good word in good season. Let us not overwhelm people. Let us share and let us be interested like the pattern, like you did. Help us, Lord, in this closing work and continue blessing this ministry. Continue blessing Natasha and Kiva and everyone else involved with this work. Thank you, Lord, for the sisters, for my sisters, for this fellowship. Provide for them the Holy Spirit. Provide it for us too. And help us work together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That was wonderful, Brother Porras. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony. It was very inspiring. And we also pray, you know, for you and your ministry as well. Um, I don't know if you have any time, um, maybe five minutes or so extra, if there are any questions uh, of, you know, folks on the line, if they'd like to. Do you have? Absolutely. Okay, great. Awesome. So if there's anyone that would like to uh, ask Elder Porras uh, any questions or share any thoughts, feel free to do so. I'll mute yourself and um, do so at this time. Okay, someone said someone has their hand raised. Okay, so let's see. Um, Muyabala. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and um, share. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Um, this is uh, Muyabala Muna from Eswatini in Southern Africa. I would like to hello. thank the brother for... Hello. I'm listening, brother. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so I would like to thank you, brother, and thank you for... Uh, medical missionary hour we really are benefiting a lot i want to thank you for emphasizing that uh, it is easier to preach the gospel because the bible says it shall be preached into all the world but there is also like you have said a, a part on that commandment that it shall be a testimony and i think really practical testimonies are more influential than verbal testimonies. So I, I thank you for really bringing us to that and uh, for defining medical missionary in that simple definition of benevolence, Christian uh, uh, services, because really that is what it is. Uh, Christ, if we look at Christ, he was definitely just going about in all villages in Matthew 5, 39 and Matthew for 23, he went into villages and towns doing good works. And those good works were really of relieving people, advising people, counseling people, healing them. And that's what made Commissioner is. And in fact, it can give us more effort in terms of winning others to the message than if we went to them with a hard word and threats and, uh, and, and all the right. So I just thought, I don't have a question, but really just a reiterating that the simplicity of what has been presented today is fundamental and each one of us can do that part which God is asking us to do. Thank you very much and God bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Muyabala. And <laughs> Flavia, you have your hand up? Yes. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, uh, my question is, uh, I just wanna thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I just, uh, I think I missed to hear your, the name of your ministry. Um, can I please have the, the name? Hi, Flavia. Yes, happy Sabbath. Um, the name of our ministry is- Sabbath to you. Choose Life Abundant. So let me see if I can just show you on the logo here of my shirt. Can you see it there? 
Yes, I can see. Choose, choose to life abundant. Choose life abundant. Choose life. Is it all one word? Yeah, you can put choose life abundant.org and you'll find us on the internet and you can see pictures of our of the rooms of the property. Um, it's just beautiful. God has done really great things in this place. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Praise God. <laughs> All right. Are there are there questions? And Brother Porras, what is the name of the institute that you studied at um, to, to get more training or even the, the lifestyle center that you went with your mom? Yes. So <clears throat> I, did, I did a lot of things to, to uh, equip myself with uh, the medical missionary work. Obviously, number one is to look for it in the Bible. So that's number one. Let the Lord be your teacher. A lot of folks feel that they need to go to school and do all these lessons, and that's fine. But your first school needs to be the Lord. Number two. Um, <clears throat> well, where I went to was Lifeline Wellness Center. Lifeline Wellness Center. Now, I will share that with a little bit of a, a footnote. When I went there, it was run by Peter Karsten. He's a German agriculture uh, gentleman that has a big heart for the Hispanic community. And he developed something called Lifeline University. And in it, um, well, he, he helps you graduate from that if you take the lessons and study for them and pass the tests. And I did that with him. Um, I, stopped, I stopped sending people out there uh, because I started discovering that See, in our wellness center here at Choose Life, we stand very strongly with the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are in sync with that. We want to bring people to church. We love the church, even though it's defective and enfeebled. It's the object of God's supreme regard. I started noticing that in this other wellness center, and I'm not, I'm not sharing this to put anyone down, but I found that they were not in agreement with the 28 fundamental beliefs. And so I felt like, I felt a little disappointed about that. And I stopped recommending folks over there. Now we have this wellness center here. We obviously want to recommend folks over here. <laughs> so that was one, one thing. But uh, besides the theology, the health message that I learned there was all biblical. It was all from the Ministry of Healing as well. And so there's no problems with that. And then the third thing that I did uh, was is, is to study. I went to the Da Vinci College of Holistic Medicine. And what I did there is I studied, in short, live blood analysis. And so I took, it took two years for me to get that done. Um, and that helps me work with my microscope here. I don't know if you can see my material, but you can see it there. And so that's the work I do. I get uh, folks to see that on the screens. The fourth thing that I did is obviously you got to read a lot. Um, this is a useful book right here. Uh, highly, highly, highly recommended. It's called by Harvest Time Books. Uh, so you can find that on the web. It's a very cheap book, but it is powerfully good. Anyway, um, the fifth thing that I did on diet and food, but the fifth thing that you do is visit sanatoriums, spend time in them volunteering. Uh, and the best way to really learn something is to actually be the patient. Uh, the moment you go through something and you find healing, trust me, that conviction will be powerful. And so that's what I started to do. I started visiting and being the book and I would take notes of everything. I would ask all these questions. I would get involved. I would just be very servant, ser service oriented. Even though I was the patient, I wanted to get my hands in the kitchen. I wanted to get my hands in helping out. 
and um, you know you 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 start finding that those that are teaching you want to have you around and uh, it's beautiful when you have someone that is so knowledgeable um, because now you can learn from them so much and they will want to they will want to impart on the knowledge because this is not about Rolando here anymore this is about discipleship and there's no greater joy for me than to see someone walk away from our our volunteers walking away and they practicing what they learn here with their folks with their families and so you get started with this by practicing putting you learn something when you teach it and so now they they're going going out there doing it and um, you will learn a lot you will learn a lot as you're working with people because sometimes people know things that you don't i mean i wouldn't say sometimes i would say a lot of the it's, it's just how it is. It's a law of life. People know things that you don't. And so they will help you sharpen a lot of your skill sets, if I might put it that way. But yeah, those are some ways of training. Where is your um, Centurion located? We are in Tennessee, Middle Tennessee. So that's two hours south of Nashville. Um, yeah, we, we are surrounded by woods, <laughs> 12 acres. Um, we have about, let's see, three rooms that we can work with. And I we are a very cheap alternative. So just to give you an example, the average out there is about, I know it's about, but uh, so I'll keep this very short, uh, very, very, very sensitive. The average is about five grand for 10 days. We are way beneath that, where we need that. And so, what we want to make is affordable. We want folks to have the opportunity to find healing um, without having to break the bank. And even though it's expensive, the way that we have it, it might still be expensive. We offer people with choices of, hey, you don't have to pay this up front. You can work with me. Uh, because ultimately, it's not about the money. Ultimately, I want you to meet God. Ultimately, I want you to be well. Uh, because that's what God wants, to prosper you, right? And so we can be tools in that uh, God, in, in the desire of God to be, in God's desires for you. Then there's no better place than that. Thank you. you yeah, you can find um, a map or, or our address in our website, chooselifeabundant.org. And you'll also see some pictures in there. Wonderful, wonderful. Are there any other questions or? Okay. Well, this has been very, very enriching, Ella Porras. We thank you again for taking the time to share with us. It was very inspiring. And I just want to close now with prayer. Um, thank you, Sister Natasha, for your ministry as well. You find great people to come and share with us uh, for Medical Missionary Hour. So let us close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for just coming to be with us and for just what we were able to learn today from Elder Porras. I pray that you will um, bless him and the ministry that you have entrusted to him. And I pray, Lord, that you will teach us and speak to us and show us the way that we should go in. Um, uh, lead us, Lord, as we want to be about your work, to be servants for you, co-laborers with you. So I just ask that your spirit will be with us uh, throughout the rest of the Sabbath day. And I pray that we will just have a high day with you today. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Amen. All right, everyone. Take care. Happy Sabbath. Bye. Happy <laughs> God Sabbath bye. to you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sister Kiva. Great job <laughs> Thank you, facilitating. Natasha. <laughs> Everyone, I hope that you'll be able to join us next week, um, the Medical Missionary Sabbath Hour. God bless. Happy Sabbath, Thank Kiva. You, Happy Sabbath. Bye, Kiva. Bye.